War has always been a part of human history. But in the 20th century, it takes on global proportions for the first time. More than one million Canadians serve in the two world wars and in Korea. Of those, more than 100,000 give their lives in the service of their country. There are those, however, who never make it to the front lines, but give their lives just the same. For the men and women who gather at a popular military night spot in St. John's, Newfoundland, fire is the enemy, trapping them behind locked doors and shrouded windows. For soldiers bound for the battlefields of Korea, the enemy is a misread message that sends their troop train hurtling to a different fate in the mountains of British Columbia. December 12th, 1942. It's Saturday night in St. John's, Newfoundland, and the port city is alive with activity. Still a part of the British Empire, the island colony's strategic location to transatlantic shipping lanes makes it a valuable base for Allied forces. St. John's in 1942 had really come to life. To, uh, with the breakout out of the war, we had an influx of uh, military people into the city. Uh, the Americans set up a, a huge uh, base uh, here in St. John's. The Canadians also came here and set up several bases around town. And we had British uh, Navy visiting St. John's. I was 15 years old, and even though there was a war on, it really didn't affect us that much, uh, us kids anyway. We saw an awful lot of sailors and soldiers on the streets. But other than that, the day went just like any other day. On the evening of December 12th, despite crisp, cold temperatures, uniforms are particularly visible as servicemen look for a place to unwind on a Saturday night. 22-year-old Maurice Weldon has just finished signalman exams with the Canadian Navy. Like many servicemen, Weldon heads for the Knights of Columbus Hostel, one of several places built specifically for military personnel, as a home away from home. The Knights of Columbus Hostel was opened in December 1941, the 16th of December. And it was for the people in our services, where they could go to sleep, rest, play, uh, be entertained, uh, go to a dance, and, and so on. This hostel housed so many boys. And they had uh, a cafeteria, ping pong tables, and I imagine a billiard table. This was set up for their entertainment, and of course an auditorium with a stage to put on shows, and anything else. There were a lot of people volunteering to entertain the troops. On the first story, there was an auditorium that could seat 350 people. The front entrance of that went into a restaurant, and then just beyond the restaurant, an exit out into the lobby. And then in the upstairs area, there was dormitories for the military personnel. The hostel is getting ready for its regular Saturday night live entertainment. Volunteers from the local Boy Scout troop are there to help, including friends Doug Furneaux and Hedley Tuff Jr. Uh, Hedley was like a typical 15-year-old, playing hockey all the time in the winter, fooling around with old cars and motorcycles, and uh, just basically having 15-year-old fun. And these boys were invited in to help, I guess, place chairs, maybe check coats, and do odd jobs like that. And uh, they were allowed to watch the show. The show is Uncle Tim's Barn Dance, broadcast live on local radio. Mostly every Saturday night, people would uh, tune into the Baron Lens, as VOCM radio. Uncle Tim was, uh, his name was Duggan, Bill Duggan. He had other people like Barry Hope, Joe Murphy, his name was, and uh, they were local performers, and they were good. Uh, so I understand that um, Baron Dance was a very popular program. My understanding was it would be quite crowded. You know, if you were on the dance floor that night, you would have to You'd have to watch yourself with uh, there'd be so many out dancing. 
55-year-old Bill Duggan is a barber by trade who loves entertaining on the side. Two of his sons perform with him. 16-year-old Durham on the drums and 20-year-old Gus, a featured dancer. The Duggans have played the hostel many times, even though Bill considers it a fire trap. It was built of uh, Newfoundland timber, uh, spruce and fir, that had dried out during the summer months. And uh, the walls were plywood and wallboard. The outsides were slate covered with an asphalt coating. But the, the major problem with the building was the roof itself, because this wasn't ventilated. Bill Duggan's main concern is the way the auditorium exits have been installed. Within the auditorium, uh, there were three exit doors, uh, four if you include the entrance to the auditorium. In the other three doors, there were two doors in each place. The inside door would open inward, but when you got this open, you had to deal with a second door. Access to the outside is further complicated by the fact that none of the doors are equipped with panic locks, and all windows and door screens are covered with plywood as part of the island's wartime blackout policy. Well, you couldn't have any light shining anywhere outside, so up to the windows in the nighttime, you had these screens that made up that had to fit right in to all the windows. Even a pin of light had to be covered, and that was the whole of Newfoundland. My father was a volunteer air raid warden, and he would have to go out certain times during the night and make sure there were no lights showing. My mother used to get very cross, of course, if we'd lift up the blinds and look out, and uh, we weren't allowed to do that. Everything was quite black in St. John's. If you went outside and looked, you wouldn't see lights anywhere. Everything was very, very dark. And that was St. John's during the war, during the blackout. The blackout is strictly enforced, particularly after recent attacks on St. John's Harbor by German submarines. That year, in September, there were two ships torpedoed at Bilal in the mining town just out in the bay. And in November, there were two more uh, torpedoed, which is right on our doorstep. I understand that the, the Germans fired some torpedoes at the entrance of St. John's Harbor, but they, but they missed. Adding to the tension are rumors that these same submarines are putting German agents ashore to infiltrate the island. There's all sorts of evidence where German soldiers were in St. John's. Bodies were found off ships with uh, stubs from movie theaters. They had been right in St. John's going to the movie. All of this sort of thing was going on during those years. Enemy agents are the last thing on the minds of the 400 men and women who packed the Knights of Columbus hostel on the evening of Saturday, December 12, 1942. Most of the crowd is in the auditorium to see Uncle Tim's barn dance. It had festoons, balloons hanging from the ceiling of different colors. It had uh, tinsel and garland strung all around to remind people to enter the Christmas season. Those too tired to celebrate are upstairs in the dormitories. Sometime before 10.30 p.m., Newfoundland militiaman Donald Roberts comes upstairs to use the washroom at the end of the two main dormitories. In the hall, he notices an open closet door and several open rolls of toilet paper on the shelf inside. The thought crosses his mind that the strands of tissue hanging down towards the floor could present a dangerous fire hazard, but he shrugs it off as he goes back downstairs to join the fun. Saturday, December 12th, 1942, 10.30 p.m. Under the cover of a military blackout, most residents in the port city of St. John's, Newfoundland are at home, trying to keep warm on this frosty night. 28-year-old Margaret Ryan and her husband are listening to the radio. Margaret's father, Bill Duggan, and brothers Gus and Derm are performing in Uncle Tim's Barn Dance, a 
about to be broadcast from the Knights of Columbus hostel across the road. In the hostel auditorium, Headley Tuff, Doug Furneaux, and the other Boy Scout volunteers have grabbed seats close to the stage to watch the show, due to begin at 11 p.m. Outside the hostel, Newfoundland constables Clarence Bartlett and Blanchard Peddle stop at the main entrance as they make their rounds. Several soldiers mill around the outside, including Corporal Raymond Hoosier, an off-duty MP with the U.S. Army. As far as the two constables are concerned, everything looks normal. Inside the hostel, it is anything but normal. In a storage closet adjoining one of the dormitories, flames work their way up a trail of loose toilet paper stacked on a shelf. The closet was full of Class A combustible materials, papers and wood. In those days, a lot of those buildings weren't insulated like we insulate them now. So I think the fire burned through the closet and got into the attic space. Once it got into the attic space, it was in a confined area. The fire burns quickly through the attic's vast interior, feeding on dry rafters and tarred roof trusses, hungrily consuming oxygen. And once it begins to use up the oxygen, it will begin to go into a smoldering condition. The room becomes totally charged with heated smoke and fire gases, all of which are combustible. Smoldering flames spread out over the auditorium and the second floor dormitories. By 11 o'clock, it has filled the entire space. What you had was a huge gas bomb right over the heads of the people below, just waiting for the right mixture of oxygen to blow the whole place to pieces. One of the most famous singers in Newfoundland, Biddy O'Toole, came out with her. And uh, near the end of that, people in the auditorium, particularly down near the front entrance, were feeling the temperature of the room had been going up. And they heard these same, this strange sounds going through the ceiling and the walls. And, and uh, it sounded like, like rats scratching on the wall. So at this time, Canadian seaman Eddie Adams took the stage and he strummed his guitar and said howdy, and he began to sing Moonlight Trail. It is 11.07 p.m. In one of the upstairs dormitories, signalman Maurice Weldon gets ready for bed. He notices a man in a Newfoundland militia uniform approach one of the closet storerooms, looking for the washroom. And uh, when he opens the door and goes in, all that air that the fire's been waiting for goes with him. It goes in the room, you get the right chemical balance within the fuels, the heat, and the oxygen, and you get the chemical chain reaction, and boom, you've got an ignition. As the Newfoundland soldier hurries downstairs to give the alarm, Maurice Weldon tries to close the closet door, but the fire has already escaped. Weldon tries to waken those already in bed, but tales of explosive blue flame already sweep across the ceiling. Weldon has no choice but to save himself. In the auditorium, fire burns through the roof of the projection booth, which holds the fuse box for the entire building, including the exit lights. On stage, 16-year-old drummer Derm Duggan can hear people in the audience getting restless. Thinking that there might be a fight, he keeps playing to divert the crowd. A split second later, Everyone in the auditorium and at home hears a piercing scream that slices through the din. All of a sudden, somebody shouted a fire, and that's when pandemonium took place. People saw a flame was coming in, and they started to get up. And there was a loud sound that went to the auditorium when the steel chairs collapsed. I think that the master ceremonies tried to announce not to panic. And of course, the lights went out, and the microphone went out, and everything went out. Margaret Ryan and other listeners at home can't believe what is happening. But no one thinks to alert the fire department, less than 300 meters from the hostel. 
that you could probably walk it in a minute and a half. But because of the World War II blackouts, neither building were able to view what was going on in the other one because of the shutters. Inside the auditorium, these same plywood shutters ignite panic in those trying to find a way out. It was complete darkness because the shutters were on the window and you couldn't see where the shutters were. You couldn't see where the doors were anymore. The crowd stampedes toward the exit through the restaurant that will take them to the main entrance, tripping over chairs and stumbling in the dark. Many never get up, overcome by lethal doses of poisonous gas. Carbon monoxide is a major product of combustion. As soon as you begin to inhale it, carbon monoxide very quickly displaces the blood's ability to absorb oxygen, and you pass out, and you die. Those who reach the exits find them jammed with people trying to get out through doors that open inward. And it's no good for you or I as one individual who's at the door first. Turn around trying to tell two or 300 people behind you, wait, back up, I got to open the door. Heat and the flame are licking at them. They want out. They're pushing. Some are able to escape, but many are cut down by blasts of gas-fed flame and searing heat, their bodies piling up in the main doorway. On stage, the performers realize there is little they can do, but dancer Gus Duggan has to try. He jumped down to try to help get the door open to the side, and he succeeded, and, and a number of people got out. Young Durham Duggan races to escape the stage, but is quickly swept under by the chaos of panicked audience members on the auditorium floor. No longer able to see his youngest son, Bill Duggan follows Joe Murphy backstage. So Murphy got his troop to go to the back of the stage, where there had been two exit windows, but they had to use one of the steel chairs to beat through that. And then he helped Uncle Tim, who was Bill Duggan, to get out to the window and then got out himself. Joe Murphy and Bill Duggan are safe, but many more remain inside, including Bill's sons, Gus and Derm. As the fire licks at the night sky, neither man has much hope for their survival. Saturday, December 12th, 1942, 11.10 p.m. In the port city of St. John's, Newfoundland, constables Clarence Bartlett and Blanchard Peddle make their nightly rounds. Suddenly, they see a flickering light in the direction of the Knights of Columbus Hostel. The building is on fire. Constable Bartlett heads inside while Constable Peddle starts ripping blackout shutters off the windows in order to get people out. Off-duty MP Raymond Hoosier also goes inside, breaking down exit doors with his shoulder. In the auditorium, Boy Scout Headley Tough runs to a west side exit and finds it blocked with bodies. He is trapped with nowhere to go. Suddenly, he spots a window etched in the firelight and sees two sailors grabbing people and throwing them out as fast as they can. They grabbed him and threw him out the window. Now, at that time, his hair was singed at the back of his head, and one of his sleeves was burnt. But that's all. He was not hurt other than that. What happened to the two sailors, I don't know. I don't know whether they eventually got out or not. But those two sailors saved an awful lot of people by just throwing them out the window. Outside, Headley stays close by to make sure that others also survive. People were jammed up against these doors, and when they really needed someone to get dragged, just physically dragging them. And Toph was one of the boys who was among the group doing that kind of work. Headley Tuff's friend, Doug Furneaux, runs to another exit, but the door is locked. Doug helps break it down. Ferno had a, a battle to get out of that auditorium himself. And when he got on the outside, a group of servicemen got together to go back in. He went in with them. And it's remarkable that uh, young boys were able to get out of the hall and, and not run away from it, as, as you might think a child might do to stay there. 
and you play the role of an adult until you couldn't do it anymore. In the auditorium, Constable Clarence Bartlett uses his belt to guide people out of the building. He went in and there were two girls. The hair had been burnt off their head and he got these two girls out. Then he went in again and the fifth time he went in, there was a large explosion of gas came in that knocked him a distance of about 25 feet. So at that point then he got out and he couldn't get, couldn't get back in there anymore. American military policeman Raymond Hoosier is still inside. As he heads to safety, he stumbles over what he thinks is a dead body. It is 16-year-old drummer Derm Duggan, miraculously still alive. Snap out of it, kid, Hoosier tells the boy as he carries him outside. It is now 11.18 p.m., and the local fire brigade has just arrived after a traffic cop sounds the alarm. All they can do is prevent the spread of fire to neighboring buildings. Despite the cold, the flames burn so hot that firemen must cool their sizzling helmets. Sunday, December 13th, 1942. The charred remains of the Knights of Columbus hostel make a stark contrast to the mantle of freshly fallen snow. The fire burned on about 2.30 in the morning, but the heat was so intense that the firemen were there till 8.30 in the morning to cool it down so they can get at the bodies that were remaining inside. Rescue workers use picks, shovels, and bare hands to pry frozen bodies from snow-covered ash. They recognize one as 20-year-old Gus Duggan, a dancer in Uncle Tim's troupe, who was trying to save lives as the auditorium burned around him. When they were going to the rubble, they found young Gus Duggan, and he was still linked hand in hand with the, the other six people who were there. It is, in fact, one of the swiftest and deadliest indoor fires in Canadian history. 99 people are dead, most of them members of the armed forces. Uh, it was a remarkable uh, that one third of those in the auditorium were women. But out of the 99 people who died, there was only about 12 women actually died that night because the men heroically did whatever they could to get the women out. After the fire, the community was in mourning, a lot of sadness and a lot of anger. A lot of anger that the building, that the house, these boys, was not better made that they hadn't seen to enough exits or easy access to the outside. The government orders an immediate inquiry to address these concerns. Justice Brian Dunfeld calls 175 witnesses, but the most telling testimony is that of Dr. Alfred Farmer, chief surgeon of the RCAF, who comes to St. John's to care for burn victims. He concluded that uh, the presence of uh, an enormous amount of gas going to the building that night rendered many people senseless. And mo most of the people, if not all, who were burnt to death had uh, been overcome by gas. It wasn't the fire that uh, killed them. Based on these findings, the Dunfeld inquiry recommends that all ceilings be ventilated and that fire retardant material be installed to slow down the spread of fire and the deadly gases it produces. The report also recommends that doors in public buildings be hinged to open outward and be equipped with panic bolts, and that all buildings have an alternate emergency lighting system on a separate circuit. As to the fire's cause, Justice Dunfeld concludes that it was not an accident, but a carefully planned arson. While the inquiry never uses the word, many believe the fire is an act of sabotage. We know for a fact that German military were in our province during the war years. Uh, right around the events of the Knights of Columbus fire on December 12th, there were other fires that occurred in this city, a YMCA hostel, for example, a military barrack block, but they were all being frequented by military people. 
they didn't catch somebody doing it or anything like that. But people suspect that, that it, it was due to uh, enemy activity. Sabotage or not, the Knights of Columbus fire brings the war a little closer to home. And after that, I realized that war was everywhere, not only across the Atlantic, but it was in our own little town. For many, like Headley Tuff Jr., the memories of that terrible December night stay with them long after the war is over. He didn't like to talk too much about it, but I'm sure it affected him because my children later on in life wanted to go to all the concerts that came to uh, Montreal. My husband would never let them go. And I think it was because he was afraid of what had happened to him in the KFC fire. 